Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering foundation slash fundamentals of nursing. It's going to be a mixed group of questions. However, many of these questions cover patient positioning. So if you've been struggling with how to position a patient with a certain uh, diagnosis, this is the video for you. Now, before we even get started, guys, please, I'm going to ask you to support my channel by doing what? By liking this video. I know you haven't watched it yet, but you're going to love the video. So go ahead, like this video now. Press that red uh, notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Engage with me in the comment section. I cannot uh, reply to every single comment, but I read every single comment. And I have a running list going of different videos that you would like to see me make. And I'm making them for you as fast as I can. But I'm asking you to please support this channel. Don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And you guys can catch me on my other social media platforms during the week where I cover a variety of NCLEX style questions, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So guys, before we get started, I always uh, I like to start with a prayer. If you're not into that, that's fine. Just fast forward. And if you are, please close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Father God. Thank you for the grace and the mercy and the compassion you have for us every single day, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father God, I ask forgiveness for our sins because I know we come short of your glory every single moment, but you love us so, so much. All we have to do is ask for forgiveness it's already been given thank you for that father god thank you for that reassurance lord i pray for every single viewer right now that's watching this video lord i ask that you please help them in that area of their life that they're struggling that area of their academic life that they need help that they just can't seem to get this particular concept or principle father god i ask that you please open up their eyes lord and i ask that you just increase their intelligence by far and help them to understand this information be able to process this information father god when they see this same type of content lord on an exam help them to be able to Think critically through um, this question, Lord, and help them to answer it appropriately. I pray for them. I pray for their children. I pray for their spouses. I pray for their loved ones, the people who are rooting them on and telling them that they can do it, not to give up. I ask that you pour a special blessing over them as well. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Jesus, and all that you'll continue to do for us. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. When caring for a client in hemorrhagic shock, how should the client position, how should the nurse position the client? One, flat in bed with the legs elevated. Two, flat in bed. Three, Trendelenburg position. Or four, semi-sitting position. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is one, flat in bed with the legs elevated. And guys, we do that to do what? Increase venous return. Isn't that the same position you put that patient when you're suspecting shock, right? So that's how we're going to do because we want to increase that venous return. Now, let's look at the other choices. Look at choice two. Put them to lie flat in bed. Um, them lying down flat, but the legs aren't elevated. Is that going to do much to increase that venous return? No. So, yeah, we can have them lie flat, but those legs need to be elevated. Look at choice three, Trendelenburg position. We used to do that a long time ago. We don't anymore because what we've learned is when you have them in Trendelenburg position, which means the... Um, sorry, the head is down here and the legs are here, you have all of those organs that are pressing down, the abdomen pressing down on the lungs and the lungs aren't really able to expand the way that they need to. On my other videos that I've done where I've talked to you guys about respirations and the importance of having gravity help that diaphragm so when you take a deep breath, the diaphragm can drop so oxygen can get into the lungs so those lungs can expand. Well, think about what happens when that patient's in Trendelenburg position. That's not happening. And on top of that, you have those other abdominal organs that are pressing up, making those lungs not be able to expand the way that we need it to. So that is false. And then choice four, um, semi-sitting position, that decreases, uh, that will decrease the venous return, especially in that patient that's going through hemorrhagic shock. So we're not going to use that. The correct answer, guys, is choice number one. An adult woman has been in an automobile accident. She sustained numerous lacerations, a fractured tibia set by closed reduction, and a mild concussion. She has no apparent renal injuries and is conscious. 
An indwelling catheter is inserted for which of the following purposes? One, to measure urine flow at urine flow as an indicator of shock, two, to prevent contamination of her cast, three, for her comfort, or four, to prevent renal complications. And guys, the correct answer is one, to measure urine outflow as an indicator of shock. So um, let me explain this to you guys. When the body goes through shock, one of the first signs and symptoms that we're going to see, one of the first things we're going to notice is that urine output go down. Why are we going to see that urine output go down? Because the kidneys start to shut down. Remember, patients are supposed to have at least, at the minimum, 30 ml per hour for urine output. And what we'll see is that urine output start to decrease, which lets us know those kidneys are shutting down. And the kidneys only shut down when something is dramatically wrong with the patient, such as that patient going through shock. So absolutely, that is the reason why we're putting them um, in that catheter. Choices two, uh, three, and four are absolutely incorrect. Um, something also, guys, I want you to keep in mind, about 25% of that cardiac output goes to the kidneys, right? So it only makes sense if the patient's going through shock. Remember, I said about 25%. So it only makes sense if that patient's going through shock when the first organs that will start to shut down are going to be the kidneys. Look at how much of the cardiac output goes straight to the kidneys. So one's the correct answer. And adults admitted with chronic renal failure. Strict INOs ordered. The client sometimes incontinent, so it's impossible to obtain an accurate record of output. How can the nurse best estimate the client's fluid status? One, estimate the amount voided each time. Two, observe skin turgor. Three, weigh the client daily. Four, record the number of voidings. You guys have to know this. This question that I'm covering with you right now, that principle is weaved in and out of NCLEX all over the place. You have to know this. So what's the answer, guys? C or three, excuse me. Weigh the client daily. When it comes to fluid status, our best indicator of fluid status is not going to be INO. It's not going to be skin turgor. It's going to be daily weights. And usually on NCLEX, they'll give you the same principle, but it'll be a patient with CHF. But guess what? The principle is still the same. When it comes to fluid status, we're doing what? Daily weight. That is our best indicator, guys. Number three is the correct answer. By the way, daily weights, same scale or same type of scale, same clothing in the mornings before the patient eats or, you know, has much to drink. Okay? Next question. A client has Crohn's disease with chronic... Di no, I can't speak. A client has Crohn's disease with chronic diarrhea. Which nursing diagnosis is most likely to be appropriate for this client? One, risk for electrolyte imbalance, metabolic acidosis related to loss of intestinal fluids. Two, risk for electrolyte imbalance, hyperkalemia related to renal potassium retention with bicarbonate. Three, risk for electrolyte imbalance, metabolic alkalosis related to excessive chloride losses in the diarrhea. Or four, risk for electrolyte imbalance, hypercalcemia related to loss of phosphorus in diarrhea. What do you think? And guys, the correct answer is four. Risk for electrolyte imbalance, metabolic acidosis related to loss of intestinal fluids. So something I want you guys to remember is base out the butt. When patient has diarrhea, base comes out the butt. Right? So number one's our correct answer because if you're losing a whole bunch of base, that can throw, that'll throw you into what? An acidic state, metabolic acidosis. That's number one. Base out the butt. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Choice two, risk for electrolyte imbalance, hyperkalemia related to potassium retention with bicarb. Well, that's not true because with that high um, GI output, the, the patient's losing potassium through that diarrhea. So how are they gonna have hyperkalemia when they're actually losing potassium? So that's false. Choice three, risk for electrolyte imbalance, metabolic alkalosis related to excessive chloride losses in diarrhea. Um, first of all, in the diarrhea, you're gonna lose sodium. You're gonna lose potassium, not much chloride. That's number one. And number two, I just told you base out the butt. So how are you gonna have um, What's to say? How are you going to have metabolic alkalosis when I just told you you're losing your base through the diarrhea? So if anything, you're going to be what? Acidic. So it can't be choice number three. 
Choice number four, risk for electrolyte imbalance, hypercalcemia related to loss of phosphorus in the diarrhea. Now, yes, you do lose um, some phosphorus in the diarrhea. The calcium may increase slightly because of that loss of, south, um, of phosphorus, but not to the point that you're going to be um, hypercalcemic. No, you do lose some phosphorus. Yes, your potassium may elevate slightly, but not to the point that you have hypercalcemia. So that's incorrect, guys. Number one is the correct answer choice. The nurse is assessing a woman upon admission. Which data should be recorded as subjective data? One, her weight's 142 pounds. Two, she has a red rash covering the backs of her hands. Three, she states, my hands itch so bad I can hardly stand it. Or four, her temperature is 99.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And guys, the correct answer is three. She states, my hands itch so bad I can hardly stand it. So when we're talking about something that's subjective, that's something that can't be measured. It's not something that you can visualize, that you can actually measure. It's something that the patient tells you, something that they feel, but you cannot measure it. Choices, one, 142 pounds. You can put them on a scale. You can measure that. That's objective. Two, a red rash. You can see that rash. You can see the color of the rash. You can measure the rash. That's subjective. Choice four, her temperature. You take her temperature and you will visually see what that temperature is. That's measurable. That's subjective. But choice three, the patient telling you what they feel, that's not measurable. That is subjective. Three is the correct answer. Which behavior by a CNA in a long-term care facility indicates the need for further instruction? One, placing bed linens at the bedside prior to giving morning care. Two, using the same basin for both residents in the semi-private room. Three, washing hands after caring for one resident and before starting care for the next. Or four, wearing unsterile gloves to clean a resident who is soiled with feces. I hope you guys all chose choice number two because that is nasty using the same wash basin for both patients in a semi-private room, that is disgusting. That is nasty. That patient, that, uh, excuse me, um, CNA needs further teaching, okay? Choices number one, three, and four, all good. Nothing wrong with those, but choice number two, that is nasty. Next question. The nurse is changing a dressing. Which behavior, if observed, would indicate a break in technique? One, the nurse opens package of four by four away from the sterile field and drops them onto the sterile field. Two, the sterile field is at waist height. Three, the nurse opens the first flap of a sterile package away from his or her body. Or four, while pouring sterile saline into a sterile basin on the sterile field, the saline splatters onto the cloth of backing. What do you think? And guys, the correct answer is number four. While pouring sterile saline into a sterile basin on the sterile field, the saline splatters onto the cloth backing. Here's the problem, guys. Um, once it gets wet, that fluid is a vehicle. It's a mode of transportation for bacteria, for pathogens, for microorganisms. So you have broken your sterile field. Choices number one, number two, and number three do not break sterile field. That's what you are supposed to do to maintain sterility. But choice number four, you broke sterility. Four is the correct answer. The nurse is caring for a woman who had a CVA and has right-sided hemiplegia. Which action is least appropriate? One, performing range of motion exercises when bathing the client. Two, changing the client's position every two hours. Three, positioning the client supine and putting the bed sheets tightly across her feet. Four, placing the client in the prone position for one hour, three times a day. And what is least appropriate, the worst thing you should not be doing is choice number three. What is the one word in choice number three that made you know that this, this is the answer because you should not be doing that? What's that one word? Do you guys see it? Tightly. Look what it says, positioning the client supine, pulling the bed sheets tightly across her feet. Why is that a problem? Because it could cause the patient to have foot drop. Think about it. They're on their back, they're in supine position, and now you're putting that bed sheet tightly across their feet. You're gonna cross, 
cause their feet to go like this and cause them to have foot drop. Remember, a patient just had a stroke. They don't have much strength on that right side. So you can cause that patient to have foot drop. Choices one, performing range of motion exercises when bathing the client. That is good. That's going to decrease um, um, stiffness. That will decrease the risk of contractures. That's a great thing. Choice two, changing the client every two hours. Of course, you know that, guys. You want to turn, cough, breathe deep that patient every two hours. We want to make sure we decrease the risk of that patient getting a pressure ulcer. Absolutely, you want to increase circulation. That is a great thing to do. Choice four, placing the client in the prone. When you put them prone, remember, we put them on their tummy. Putting them in a prone position for one hour, three times a day. That's good. Why? We want to prevent hip contractures. So, yes, putting them on their tummy... Um, a couple times a day will help prevent that hip contracture. You can't leave them there all day, guys, but turning them over a couple times a day, absolutely, those are great things to do. But choice number three, absolutely not. That can cause foot drop. The nurse is caring for an adult who had abdominal surgery this morning. Which action will do the most to prevent vascular complications? One, turning the client, turning the client every two hours. Two, encouraging deep breathing and coughing every two hours. Three, have the client move her legs and takes and make circles with her toes every two hours. Or four, dangle the client as soon as she is awake and alert. What do you think? And the correct answer, guys, is three. Have the client move her legs and make circles with her toes every two hours. How many of you guys got tricked by this question? Because let me tell you what they tried to do. They sprinkled in some wonderful things to do for your patient to make you choose that answer, right? Look at choice one, turning the client every two hours. That is a great thing to do. They just had surgery. We always want to get our patients moving around and turn them. Remember, turn, cough, deep, breathe. Absolutely, we want to do that. But go back to the question. It says... Why are we doing this to prevent vascular complications? So what we're, what we're caring about, guys, are vascular complications such as what? DVT formation, thrombophlebitis. So even though number one is a good thing to do, it's not going to help prevent those um, vascular complications. So that's not the answer. I tell you guys this all the time. When you're looking for your answer choice, it's not enough that you have an answer that's correct. You have to have an answer that's correct for your question. Is it answering the question that's given to you? So it can't just be a beautiful answer choice. Is it answering your question? And if it's not as much as you love that answer choice because it's a beautiful answer choice, you can't choose it because it's not answering your question. Choice number two, encourage the patient to deep breathe and cough every two hours. Absolutely, you want to do that, especially after surgery, because remember, any patient that has had surgery, we don't care what type of surgery it is. If they had surgery, we're concerned about infection. We're concerned about hemorrhage. We're concerned about formation of DVT, that DVT traveling and turning into a pulmonary embolism. So we want them to turn cough, deep breathe. Absolutely. But this question is specifically asking us about vascular complications. And so as wonderful as choice number two is, it doesn't answer our question. So we have to move on. Choice number four, dangle the client as soon as she's awake and alert. We don't have enough information in the question that would even tell us dangling that patient as soon as they get up is appropriate. That's number one. And number two, even if we did have that information, how does that help us with the vascular complications? So guys, choice number three is the answer. Having her move the legs, make circles with the toes every two hours, that increases venous return. And at the same time, it decreases venous stasis. Why is it so important to decrease venous stasis? What happens when blood doesn't move? It clots. And before you know it, you have that patient, that patient has a DVT. So guys, choice number three is the correct answer. The nurse observes that an elderly man who's bedridden and has a reddened area on the coccyx. I read that wrong. The nurse observes that an elderly man who is bedridden has a reddened area on the coccyx. The skin is not broken. The nurse most correctly interprets this pressure ulcer to be at which stage? One. Pre-ulcer 2, stage 1, 3, stage 2, or 4, stage 3. What do you think?
All right, guys, and the correct answer is choice. Where was I? Oh, there we are. Choice two. Stage one pressure ulcer. How do we know this? So guys, with the stage one, that area is going to be red in. It's going to be non-blanchable, but there's no break in the skin yet. And that's what we're dealing with. Go back to the question. It tells you, first of all, they tell you that the patient's bedridden. The minute you see a patient is bedridden, something start, should start going in the back of your mind, including pressure ulcer, because if they're bedridden, they're not moving the way that they're supposed to, and so they might be having pressure on those bony prominences, right? So the first thing is they told us that they're bedridden. Now they told us that the area's red on that bony prominence, but the skin's not broken. That is a pressure one. Look at choice three, stage two. Stage two is when that um, skin is now open, but it's gone to the dermis. It hasn't gone lower than that. Stage two, as I was saying, um, the skin is broken. It goes to the dermis. And then look at stage three. That's choice number four. That, the skin's open. It goes past the dermis to where? The subcutaneous fatty layer, right? So stage one, redden non-blanchable, no break in the skin. Stage two, break in the skin to the dermis. Stage three, pass that dermis to the subcutaneous fatty layer. Now look at choice number one, pre-ulcer. That doesn't exist. That was just there to throw you guys off, okay? So guys, the correct answer for this question is choice two, which is stage one. An older adult who has a stage one pressure also asked the nurse why a clear dressing has been put over the site when the skin is not broken. What should the nurse include when replying? One, the dressing is a preventative measure to protect the skin from injury. Two, covering it so the area is mo moist and makes it heal faster. Three, covering the area makes it more comfortable for you. Or four, the clear dressing is designed to let light through and promote healing. And guys, the only correct answer here is choice number two, covering it so the area is moist and makes it heal faster. So guys, that moist skin will make it heal faster than dry skin, and that's why we do it. Two is the correct answer. All of these, these other choices are absolutely false. That is not why we're doing it. Choice number two is why. That moist skin will make it heal faster. It'll promote healing faster than the dry skin would. An adult is now alert and oriented following abdominal surgery. What position is most appropriate for the client? One, semi-sitting, two, prone, three, supine, or four, sims. And guys, the correct answer is one, semi-sitting. So I want you to think about it. They just had abdominal surgery. So the reason semi-sitting is the best position, remember I told you that diaphragm sits like this, right under the lungs. When you take a deep breath, they're supposed to drop so the oxygen, there's room for oxygen, and then you breathe out, it pops back up, right? So that semi-sitting position is a great position because number one, gravity is helping that diaphragm to drop down when that patient takes a deep breath. That's number one. Number two, there's less pressure on um, the lungs so that they can expand appropriately. That's number two. And number three, gravity is also helping with what? Drainage drainage of the abdominal area. So guys, number one is the uh, that semi-sitting position. That is the best position for a patient who has had abdominal surgery. Number one is the correct answer. The following, excuse me, following a craniotomy, the nurse positions a client in a semi-reclining position. For which reason? One, to promote comfort. Two, to promote drainage from the operative site. Three, to promote thoracic expansion. Or four, to prevent circulatory overload. Overload. And you guys should get this all correct because I really just gave you the answer. What do you think? Two, to promote drainage from the operative site. So. Um, I kind of gave you the answer with the last question when I told you to promote drainage, but let me explain this because now we're talking about craniotomy. The patient had um, surgery where? In the brain, right? So let's talk about this. Or in the head, I should say. So the reason why that um, semi-reclining position is appropriate, 
is for drainage, right? Because gravity helps with the drainage, but why? Why is that so important? If we don't have drainage, that patient who just had the craniotomy, what are we concerned about? We're concerned about fluid building up, pressure on the brain, and what? Increased intracranial pressure. That is a medical emergency for a patient to have increased intracranial pressure. So drainage of fluids is very important for a patient who just had a craniotomy. Now let's look at the other choices. One, to promote comfort. Semi-reclining position <coughs> may promote comfort because the patient won't be having increased intracranial pressure, but that's not why we're, we're doing it. We're doing it to prevent increased intracranial pressure. So that's not it. Choice three, to promote thoracic expansion. Yes, that semi-reclining -recl position does help to promote um, thoracic expansion. Yes, I just answered that in the last question, but that's not why we're doing it for a patient who just had a craniotomy. You see how that's a beautiful answer choice, but it doesn't answer our particular question? So it's wrong. And then choice four, to prevent circulatory overload. Um, that position doesn't do too much to prevent circulatory overload. So that's incorrect. The correct answer, guys, is choice number two. Again, we want to decrease drainage to decrease pressure on the brain that will decrease the risk of cerebral edema, intracranial pressure. The nurse is observing two UAPs log roller client who had a laminectomy yesterday. Which observation indicates that the procedure is being incorrectly performed? One, one person moves the head and shoulders and the second person moves the hips and legs at the same time. Two, the UAPs use a turning sheet to help turn the client. Three, one person keeps the client from falling out of bed while the other person first moves the head and shoulders, then the hips and legs. Or four, the UAPs place the bed in the highest position prior to turning the client. Okay, guys, so the one that's incorrectly performed is three. One person keeps the head from falling out of the bed while the other person, look, first moves the head and shoulders and then the hips and legs. Excuse me, this patient that just had a laminectomy that needs to be log rolled. Excuse me, when we're log rolling a patient, that body has to move as one unit. We cannot have in any twisting motions of that spinal cord. We cannot have flexion. We cannot have extension, hyperextension of the body at all. That body needs to move as one unit. Choices one, choices two, choices four are all correct for log rolling. But choice three, absolutely not. That is incorrect. So that's the one, that's the correct answer choice because we were looking for the wrong um, answer. Okay, guys, we are down to our last question. A client has just returned to the nursing care unit following a hemorrhoidectomy. What order should the nurse expect? One, a cis bath, a stat, and every other day. Two, warm compresses to the surgical area as needed. Three, a hot water bottle to the surgical area as needed. Or four, an ice pack to the surgical area. And guys, the correct answer is going to be four, an ice pack to the surgical area. So when it comes to the hemorrhoidectomy, that first 24 hours, that patient's gonna get cold. They're gonna get ice, okay? So that's why we're gonna expect the ice. We want to um, prevent edema to that area. So after that first 24 hours, that when, that's when we start applying heat to promote healing. But the first 24 hours, we are concerned about edema. So we expect that doctor to order an ice packet. Now look at the wrong answer choices. One, a sits bath stat in every other day. No. We expect a sits bath after the first day. So patient had um, the hemorrhoidectomy. After that 24 hours, then we expect the sits bath to promote healing because remember, that's what the, the warmth is going to do. <coughs> Excuse me, but not immediately after the surgery. Choice two, warm compresses. Again, that warmth, we expect to give it after the first 24 hours. Choice three, let's stop at the word hot because we don't put anything hot because we can what? Burn the patient. So we're not going to do that. So um, guys, the correct answer is the ice pack because... We're going to give that within the first 24 hours, 24 hours. And guys, that's it for this video. Let me know what you thought about in this video. Let me know if there's something 
that I haven't covered, you want me to cover, or you'd like to see more of, um, please engage with me in the comments. Another way that you can support this channel is by sharing my videos. Share my videos on your social media, on Facebook or Instagram. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And you guys can watch me covering different types of questions almost every single day on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching this video, and you guys will catch me on the next video.